this time on episode 309 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. We discuss Cloak and Dagger, season 2, episode 3, Shadow Cells, and season 2, episode 4, Rabbit Hold, and weekly Marvel news. I'm Michelle Ely from the Starlight Tribune, an Arrow TV show fan podcast, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other amazing geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the S.H.I.E.L.D. director. Now it's time for your scheduled debriefing. I'm Director SP. I'm Agent Haley. And I'm Agent Michelle. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a Marvel Comic Universe fan show. This show is recorded on Sunday, November 24, 2019, live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast New Orleans wide via www.geeks.live. Come and join our live chat and talk with us as we record. Ladies, happy National Sardines Day. Yay. It's the only day. This, this, it is the sole national day on November 24th. There is no other day on November 24th. I couldn't choose anything else than National Sardines Day. I guess if you like, you know, preserved fish, I'm sure it has saved many lives. We need to make up a new holiday is what you're saying. Michelle, this would be a perfect day for your cupcake day. Oh, the International Morning Cupcake Day? Yeah. Which are just muffins? Yeah. <laughs> That's what muffins are, people. Breakfast cupcakes. They're breakfast cupcakes. Sometimes, sometimes a lot of things for breakfast are just dessert. like. Pancakes with like the icing and the stuff, like IHOP stuff. You say that like it's a bad thing. I'm not. I'm not saying that as a bad thing. I am so not. But yeah. <laughs> there's rolls. There's sweet rolls. There's donuts. There's all sorts of sugary cereal. Let's face it. Breakfast is bear claws. Your morning dessert. That's what. Okay, fine. We're celebrating the first annual morning dessert day. Ooh, you've you've g- taken a leap. You've gone beyond the morning cupcakes and you've gone to morning dessert. Exactly. Uh, so we had a potluck on Friday and I had leftover apple dump cake. So that's been my breakfast the last two days. Nom, nom, See? nom, nom. Um, nom, nom, nom. All right. So breaking format a little bit. If anybody out there wants to get us your favorite breakfast sugary goodness, please let us know. We'll talk about it on a future episode. In the meantime, we're going to move on with the rest of the show. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a fan-based podcast on the ABC television show Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. for a few more months anyway, the multiple Marvel small screen series for a few more months anyway, and the Marvel Cinematic and Comic Book Universes in general. Because we get all the channels. If you'd like to talk to us about all of the channels, you can visit our website, legendsofshield.com. You can leave us a voicemail of all the channels you watch at 844-THE-BUS-ONE. It's 844-843-2871. You can talk about all the channels you watch on our Facebook page, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Podcast. You can tweet us the long list of shows you still need to watch on Twitter at Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. And you can watch us talk about all the shows we watch on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash gunnageek. You can tell your Amazon device to enable Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. skill. And you can talk about a lot of things with us on our Discord server at gunnageek.com slash Discord. And remember, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a proud member of the gunnageek.com network. Proud member indeed. And also, we do have an absence this week. Agent Lauren is not with us, but she should be back next week. I don't know, ladies. What do you think? Can we do the show without her? Depends on how many of us are here next week. I mean, I mean, we are now just stating the obvious there, SP. I mean, it's not like we like that. Not you know, we want Lauren here, but can we do the show without her? We're here, so you've actually answered your own question. 
Well, we haven't really just dis- uh, started the discussion on the main topic yet. So, I mean, we could have just ended the show here and just pushed it off till next week. Okay. All right. Bye. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to watch, we're going to straighten this out <laughs> and then we'll see if we come back with the main topic. I'm at least going to talk about Cloak and Dagger episodes Shadow Selves and Rabbit Hole from the second season. These aired on Freeform on April 11th and April 18th. Haley, if you're still with me, who is the creative team behind Shadow Selves? This episode was directed by Matthew Hastings. He has 21 directing credits starting in 2000 with one episode of The Outer Limits, six of Painkiller Jane, one of Flash Gordon, one of Drop Dead Diva, nine of Eureka, one of Warehouse 13, 13. <laughs> 10 of the originals, <laughs> one of Cloak and Dagger, 10 of Shadowhunters. The episode was written by Kate Rorick and Marcus J. Guillory. Kate has six writing credits starting in 2007. Those include four episodes of Law and Order Criminal Intent, four of Welcome to Sandition, three of Emma Approved, 20 of the Lizzie Bennett Diaries, seven of the Librarians, and three of Cloak and Dagger. Marcus Guillory has seven writing credits starting in 2009. Those include one of The Breaks, two of Cloak and Dagger, ten a story editor, and one of Empire. So for everybody's edification there, Haley's hesitance on the warehouse credit was because in the show notes, it was listed as warehouse 12. And I just want to point out that warehouse 12 was actually within warehouse 13. It was. Yeah. They talked all about the previous warehouses and warehouse 12 was one of them. (gasps) Right. But that was not the name of the show. That's true. It was not the name of the show, but they did talk about warehouse 12 within warehouse 13. They did, okay. but they still, that's still not the name of the show. Yeah, it's Michelle made a typo. There we go. Which rarely happens. Michelle's very good with the show notes. Yeah, usually the typos are Star Pie's fault. They're most, yes, almost <laughs> always mine, as well as the mispronunciations and the flat out wrong facts, I guess, that come out every once in a while. Anyway. Michelle, since we're talking about your great show notes, why don't you continue telling us about the creative team behind the second episode that we're going to talk about this week, Rabbit Hole. This episode was directed by Amanda Rowe, has nine directing credits starting in 2013, including two episodes of Siren, three Shadowhunters, one Cloak and Dagger, two Lied as a Feather, and one Nancy Drew. Written by Joy Kekin, has nine writing credits starting in 1998. Two, Homicide Life on the Street. One of The Division. Three, The Wire. Four, Tales. Two, Cloak and Dagger. And one, Motherland Fort Salem. Written by Jay Holtham. Has seven writing credits starting in 2013. Nine episodes of Pitch. Two, Cloak and Dagger. One, Jessica Jones. And two, Supergirl. And Cloak and Dagger, the TV show, was based on the Marvel comics of the same name by Bill Metlo and Ed Hannigan. All right, we're going to talk about the episodes as we always do. We're going to start off with talking about the themes of the episode and relating it to the titles of the episode. And this is Haley's forte. So, Haley, why don't you take a stab at Shadow Selves? Well, this is the one where we see, um, we kind of go back a little bit and we see the life that Mayhem was leading prior to us finding out who she was. And we also got to see kind of the priest and the reason he um, abandoned the life that he had. Okay, that's good enough. Michelle, are you happy with Haley's assessment there of Shadow Cells? Yeah, I mean, we are looking at Mayhem being part of basically Bridget and mayhem they're not whole they're they're two separate halves of a whole so they are they're really not um themselves you know ty's mother is we find out that his parents are separated and so she's almost like a shadow of her former self tyrone's pushing himself there's a lot of you know stuff going on there okay fair we'll talk about a lot of that stuff later as we go here but 
Haley, let's wrap this up and let's talk about Rabbit Hole. Does the title meet the theme of the episode? Yeah, so going down the rabbit hole, uh, that's what happened in Alice in Wonderland. Alice went down the rabbit hole and ended up in Wonderland. And, you know, we see Tandy going down the rabbit hole, going into Ty's whatever world to find mayhem and then also happens to find somebody else. All right. Michelle, once again, are you happy with Haley's assessment of rabbit hole? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not whole, it's hold, like holding on to the rabbit. Oh, well, I misread that entirely. I know, I keep trying to like, look, I mean, it, it's rabbit hold. I, I kept trying, I kept checking the title. In that case, I don't know what a rabbit hold is. Holding a rabbit? Well, it's like the sleeper hold, except for with rabbits. Well, in a way... Tandy kind of pulls a rabbit out of Ty's cloak, you know, instead of pulling a rabbit out of the hat. So it's almost like she had a hold of a particular rabbit. In this case, something, you know, a rabbit can be something that like scurried away and hid, and that would be Connor's. And Tandy pulled him out. That's not why Tandy went in there. She went after Mayhem. Right, but it was an accident. By taking his badge out, I assume that's what released him. She got hold of the wrong rabbit. There you go. There's your rabbit hold. I'm happy with it. So let's go back. Let's talk about these two episodes because we're covering two episodes of Cloak and Dagger as we go through. Matter of fact, that might be the case because we have such a big backlog on any future series that we cover is to do two episodes of the same series in the same week. So let's talk about Shadow Selves a little bit. We get Mina Hess back. I mean, she's doing an experiment on the rats or lab rats, which unfortunately Lauren's not here this week to talk about lab rats, which I assume she went giddy over when she saw it. But Mina is doing some experiments to try to replicate what happened to the masses during the exposure to the Roxon element, whatever we're going to call it. And she found out through really happenstance that the mice split when introduced to an electrical outage and the lights coming back up. So it was nice seeing Mina back and it kind of helped explain what the heck happened with Bridget and Mayhem. We also learned that the hostile half always tries to kill, well, almost always tries to kill the docile half. True. And Bridget or Mayhem tried that with Bridget as well. And she was interrupted, but then she decided not to do that. Michelle, why did she decide not to kill Bridget? Well, she overheard that Connors had tried to kill her before. And Mayhem probably remembered that, oh, yeah, that's the one who shot us. True you know, help me become mayhem, but still, that's the one that shot, you know, that's the person who shot us. And, you know, and so instead of suffocating her, puts the pillow back and it's like, okay, we're, I'm going to get Connors for the both of us. And I still might get you later. It seems to be her motif as she goes along. And then she goes on this almost year-long quest trying to find Connors. And of course, nobody knows where Connors is because he's not in the normal dimension. As we know, we find out later he's in the land of Loa or whatever we want to call it. And so she goes to Father Degado, and we'll talk more about him later, and gets some interesting advice from him. And she decides after talking to him to go after a new quest, which is going after these girls, which is where we find her at the beginning of the series season anyway. She had to replace one obsession with another. Well, uh, the priest, I think, said something along the lines of if you have to kill, make sure you kill those that deserve it first. And I would say human trafficking, if you're in that, you, yeah, that's not a bad way to go. Legally, of course, I can't say that. Not, that's not legal advice. It's not legal advice, but yeah, slavers are evil. There we go. Yep. <laughs> I said it. 
And Father Degato basically saying, I'm not a priest anymore. You can't confess to me, but basically they start talking about it anyway. So Father Degato, we've seen last season that he was involved in DUI, probably with a death or two, at least one death. And that plus what happened with Tyrone, he ends up leaving the school. I wasn't completely sure why he left the school. So Michelle, can you go over why he left the school and the priesthood? So he said that he should have been fired. I think part of it has to deal with what happened to like Tyrone. He he didn't suspend Tyrone when he should have. And I guess that could have been seen as him not taking proper dealing with it in a proper way that possibly could have helped Tyrone or just something like that. It's it's one of those things that they, they, that's one of the things about like the first and the second season when it comes to Father Delgado. A lot of the dots you have to connect yourself, which is why I, um, him quitting the school and stuff, I thought that happened last season as one of the things I thought happened last season. It actually happens this season. And yeah, and then him preaching on the box. Uh, see, I didn't, I didn't take it as having to do with Tyrone. I saw it as, so we don't know exactly when this DWI happened, but maybe reawakening guilt he had felt at the time that he'd done it. Like he had thought originally that he could atone for it by staying in the priesthood and helping kids. And then when that guilt came back and he saw all of his things that he had done again, he was like, no, I, I'm not worthy of absolution. I should just be destitute on the streets and i'm you know if they knew what i had done they would fire me for that they would fire me for the killing the girl in the dwi well he's being sort of taken care of by mayhem because mayhem fishes him out of the street gives him alcohol a little bit just to help him with his addiction i guess it's not helping him get over his addiction it's just helping him be addicted but She's trying to be nice in Mayhem's way to him, I guess. And their relationship was interesting to me. It's just the fact that they were polar opposites almost, and yet they were getting along well enough to have civil conversations. True. That is true. I mean, I mean, I guess he's the closest thing she has to a friend because as we learn, She's the only one he or he's the only one she interacts without without trying to kill him or threatening to kill him and kind of Tandy. Yeah. And, and when we when we when uh, O'Reilly finds Mayhem's place, I mean, that guy Dale or something was like, oh, I made eye contact. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we definitely stuff happened off screen there because you saw Mayhem rent the room. But then you didn't see what happened with the clerk. I'm guessing they may have shot a scene or something along the way that it just didn't show. But yeah. Well, I just assume that every time she goes in, or at least at the beginning, he always said or did something. And she made it clear what would happen if he said or did those things. So now he knows the rules. Yeah. And he knows he, he did bad. I don't know. What would she do to him? If he broke the rules, is she going to reach through Slit the glass? Throat. Yeah, I guess. With those green fingernails. Long green fingernails. Think of all the spa treatments that you have to go to to keep those. Well, it's one of the things you have to remember. She has green nail polish. O'Reilly has red. I didn't see O'Reilly's nail polish, but I did notice her. Her eyes and her fingernails give mayhem away. Also, her, her lipstick is very different. Oh, I didn't notice her lipstick. What color is her lipstick? It, it's just a very red red. Mm. And O'Reilly's is not that noticeable. It's more nude or... I, I don't know if it's nude. It's just not as pronounced. Okay. Well, we also had some surprises from Tyrone's mom. We find out that she's... Um, what do you call it, A ward... Precinct member, something like that. 
uh, a pop, basically a, a local politician. She's probably in the pocket of Roxanne. She's not with Ty's dad anymore. You alluded to that, Michelle. This is the first time that I, I really noticed that because we did see Ty stalking his parents independently, but we never saw them together. So this gives credence that they're not together. Anymore. See, I didn't think she was in the pocket of Roxanne. Like, I think she works for Roxanne, which we already knew. But it seems like maybe Connor's uncle has also gotten to her because uh, we saw Connor's ex-partner who has some sort of relationship with Connor's uncle. So I kind of think that he's the one that's pulling the strings. She might not be aware that he's the one, but I think it's him. I thought I spied somebody that in the crowd that I thought might have worked for Roxanne. That's why I went there. So it's nebulous, but yeah, I'll subscribe to your interpretation right there. No big deal there. And then Adina, that's her first name, by the way, was once a car thief. That was interesting. She was able to uh, steal a car in under 10 seconds. That's hard to do these days. I guess that's something to be impressed by. I was impressed. I was impressed that she knew how to steal a modern car because the security has changed very much in like the last 20 years. I mean, it was an older modern car, but yes, you're right. It was still a modern car. It wasn't like a 1970s Caprice Classic or something like that where you can just pop off the steering wheel and get to the stuff and away you go. So, yeah. Ty's mom full of surprises. And the actor that plays Ty's mom, by the way, is also a former ER actress. Yeah, Gloria Rubin. Mm -hmm. So ER, once again, bringing all sorts of characters into the Marvel Universe. Well, when you have a show that runs for 20 years or however long ER went, and a lot of turnover in a very large cast, like, those people are going to show up in a lot of places. Sure. I was hoping for more of a yay. It was great. Also, Ming Na Wen is the best. Sorry. Thank you. We do see some different powers with Ty and Tandy in this episode. Tandy basically just goes off with her powers, but she does have her powers taken away. So we got to talk about that. It was willingly and it was in response to being able to walk around the land of Lao. Basically, she had to deposit her dagger and get a coin back. And when she did it, she recognized that Ty's powers were going to be taken too, which did not help Ty out too much until the very end of the episode. Yep. Okay. It's like, I don't want to spoil things. But it's very important to really talk about the difference between how when Mayhem goes in, it's still that same gas station, but she saw Fuchs. Mm -hmm. When Tandy went into there, there's still the gas station, but she saw Roxanne and she saw Young Ty. And that's when we learn that the first person that you meet is basically the keeper of the crossroads. Ha, who's had many names, mm -hmm. St. Peter and Papa Legbe. Crowley. And there were rules. And she broke the rules when she produced a shard in there, when she let her, when she, she was supposed to let go, which she said that she, the shards don't come out sometimes unless she's angry or she feels threatened. It was, it was that whole, not only giving up her power, but letting go of that part. And she said, well, this is the only thing that keeps me safe. Papa Legbe said, no, it's not. And she sort of forgot that. But we also saw when we saw the fragments of herself in the mirrors where there were many different versions of her and she could choose which one she wanted to be. She chose the one with the dagger. I don't know if she could choose any of them to pass or if she had to choose one to pass through the wall of mirrors. That wasn't clear to me. Well, she walked closer to it and the one that said not today, that's the one that you saw last. And the lower dimension, pay attention to when anybody's in there. It was, that's why it, to me, it's very important. I don't want to dominate the lower discussion. I want your input. Well, it was 
a little bit uh, head scratching on what was going on when they were in there. I mean, obviously it was Connors had been in there for a while because you saw all of the rain coated cloaked people in there and he was definitely freaked out. He did not want to talk to anybody while he was in there. Well, he's been in there for eight months on the outside world and we don't know exactly how time passes in the lower dimension. But he does get out, and the first thing he does when he gets out is he runs away. He doesn't bother sticking around or anything. That's going to be, hunting him down is going to be something for the next few episodes. Also, let's talk about the lower dimension. Let's talk about the record store. The record store brought out, again, the daddy issues, basically, that Tandy had with, with a, an abusive, a physically abusive father. and. It wasn't just once. It was definitely a pattern of behavior. Also, did the actor change? I think the actor portraying Nathan changed. I didn't notice that. No, I just, because we're seeing him differently, we're seeing him meaner now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in most of season one, we only ever saw him mostly in the car as the loving father, and he was on that phone call. But yeah, he was always like a nice guy that we saw, and that's not what we're seeing of him this season. Oh, well, it's still the Save the Cheerleader guy, right? From Heroes? No. Oh, I thought that's who it was. I don't think so. I was pretty sure that's where I remembered him from. I don't know. I'm going to have to look into that. Anyway, uh, we have the whole record store which happened, and Mayhem was trying to help Tandy out by saying, you don't need to listen to this and she goes ahead and listens to it and experiences it again and then mayhem is out and about and had left and was going to try to kill connors and you no know, i actually don't blame mayhem for that but then mayhem doesn't come back but she because she's only half a person so i'm thinking just prognosticating a little bit here that maybe in order to get mayhem out Bridget has to go in, and maybe they come out as one whole in the end. I don't know. Well, I'm remembering something that was said last season about the divine pairing and how one of them has to die. So I'm thinking, like, Tandy and Ty aren't the divine pairing that we actually need to be looking at. I kind of think maybe it's Mayhem and Bridget, and one of them will have to sacrifice themselves to do something this season. Sacrifice seems to be a big thing with these people, the whole divine pairing and everything. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we go. And Michelle's through. lips are getting very thin. Yeah. Have to go through that again. Well, you wanted to hear what we thought about the Loa dimension. So that's what we're talking about. No, I love it. I, I you know, it's, uh, it's important that it's a mall. Like the part that they go into Esplanade, Esplanade, that's what they... I didn't know what that was. I mean, not knowing, but it, it made me think of explanation. Uh, yeah, I looked at the definition of the word. Apparently, it's an open level space separating a fortress from a town. Or something where you, you can walk for pleasure. So I think that's interesting. But yeah, knowing the pattern of how the lower dimension works and seeing what stores are there and what you have to do in order to navigate it it's important and i'm bringing it up because it gets talked about again the lower dimension has a big part of this season papa leg bay is this isn't like a one-off thing this is something that i'm that's why i'm like trying to like make sure you understand we're going back Okay. It's important. So it was interesting to me that Tandy stuck with Papa as the name versus like St. Peter or something like that. So she decided Papa was the name that she wanted to use. So that's the name that we're going to use here is called the guardian at the crosswords Papa. And yeah, it was interesting to get little Tyrone back. It was interesting to see Fuchs in the refrigerator wanting some girlfriend pancakes make some girlfriend pancakes there that was creepy 
uh, especially since we saw the refrigerator being thrown down the stairs once Mayhem got back into the apartment. And was that the same refrigerator? Because the refrigerator that left seemed to be a stainless steel refrigerator, and I think Fuchs was in a white refrigerator. It was his refrigerator from his apartment. Oh. He, Fuchs was found in his own home. Right, right. Okay, gotcha. Right. And I, I just want to make sure, you know, the record store didn't just have Tandy's records. It had right. records of the missing girls and then, and such. It just wasn't Tandy. Lots other and lots people. of yeah, missing there were girls. Lots. Because they made a point of, of panning back to make sure that you saw that it was just stock of records for all these girls all right i'm gonna admit i'm wrong by the way so nathan bowen is played by andy dillon and not jack coleman who was noah bennett in heroes so my bad they just looked similar to me last season my dad does that all the time too where he sees somebody and he's like that's that other guy from that other thing and we're like no it's not yeah yeah it is and we'll say we can look it up no it's him it's him so we have those discussions all the time in the house, too, and I just pull up IMDb and I find out right away. I'm, I'm not like your dad and like, no, I'm right. <laughs> anyway, I enjoyed these two episodes. In retrospect, it seemed like it was a little bit longer. We haven't talked about the pacing in a while because it kind of picked up at the end of season one. But how do you ladies feel about the pacing of these two episodes? Haley, let's start with you. I think the pacing of the season is better than last season. It just it took so long to figure out what was going on at the beginning of last season. This season, I guess maybe the beginning was a little slow again because you've kind of got them figuring out what's going on with the girls. Um, but th- I mean, it seems like it's kind of picking up now. I enjoyed all the action around saving the girls and whatever and mayhem coming in and creating mayhem, whatever. Where, whenever mayhem's around, you know, action's going to occur. And yeah, I didn't feel like it was dragging too much. Although, like I said, in retrospect, the land of Lao was a a little bit slower than I would have liked in an action packed sequence. But in the other hand, you have to have all this background in order to make it to the end. Anyway, that's my opinion. Michelle, watching this again, what did you think about the pacing of these two episodes? I like that we're doing two a week because I watch these when they aired and it felt slower when it came out like i was watching them one time a week so i kind of like how we're doing it two a week because it for me it feels it feels better okay so you're still in that camp i wanted to point out the storytelling especially when we were going into mayhem's past and all that with the first episode here with the shadow selves episode and you did get a lot of of going back and forth in there and it was nice when they showed how many days since the incident or whatever on the bottom so you had a frame a time frame of where they were as things were progressing it wasn't time jumping all over the place but it was going back from the present to the past present to the past and you know coming from watching a show like arrow when you had the flashbacks and now the flash forwards it just seems to be what is working with these superhero shows these days um arrow did the thing though where they changed like the color scheme and the lighting and stuff so you knew when you were in a flashback or a flash forward and if you happen to miss the chiron on these about you know this is when we are then it got a little confusing i did have to back it up a couple of times like okay are we in the present or are we in the past so yes you're right chiron is that what it's called yeah when they put text on the bottom of the screen i did not know that So I enjoyed these two episodes. I look forward to seeing the rest of the series. And this is it. These are the last episodes of wherever we're going to get a cloak and dagger other than the crossover in the next season of Runaways, which comes out in less than a month now. I guess I need to finish season two. You should. I mean, we did a whole series of podcasts on it. Yeah. Yeah, but I missed the last couple. So I still have like four episodes to watch. They're good. Six episodes. You, you, you'll get through them. It's fine. I will. I just need to time. Time is what I need. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about this episode, Michelle? 
No, I I talked about what I want people to pay attention to, so I'm good. Okay, Haley. Uh, I think I've done enough mad theorizing for the week. That's what Haley's known for her themes of the episode and mad theorizing. Well, next Sunday, we're going to talk about Cloak and Dagger Season 2, Episode 5 and 6 called Alignment Chart and B-Sides. Ooh, B-Sides. There's a record thing for you right there. And we'll talk about that next week. So really, there's only one news item that we're going to talk about this week. Isn't that right? It's sad news. It is. But we kind of saw it coming. Yeah, we speculated on when this was going to happen. I don't think anybody was thinking it was going to be this quick. And it happened on November 18th. And it was an article that was run by Newsarama.com that was brought to our attention in our Discord server by Randy Walker. So thank you very much, Randy. And it was all about the fact that Hulu's Runaways Season 3 will be its last season because they made the announcement of the trailer and the poster and they said, welcome to Runaways last season. So this will be it, really. It's the only other thing that was in production pre-Jeff Loeb, post-Jeff Loeb leaving Marvel, whatever you want to call it. It was the only thing left in production. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is still out there, but its final season is going to air next summer in 2020. This was it. There was not, there's nothing else out there. And I think this is definitely Kevin Feige putting his foot down and saying, no, we're not going to do this. So we have to wait till the Disney Plus stuff? Is that what I'm just realizing? I think I'm just realizing that. We have no, <laughs> there's no live Marvel TV stuff until Disney Plus, right? Yeah. Yeah, but there's there's a ton of stuff that we haven't talked about yet. I guess you're you're caught up, so you've seen all of it. But, like, we've got Legion still to talk about, Gifted. We've got all the Netflix shows that we didn't get to yet. Yeah, I don't want to talk about Gifted personally. If you guys want to talk about it, go ahead. Okay. But that was two seasons on Fox. And admittedly, I get why it was so intriguing to everybody, because it was about the mutants, basically the the new generation of mutants. And it was good from that aspect, but didn't get really great ratings. And I think another reason that Kevin Feige just didn't want to do that is he wanted to go forth with a consolidated universe, one that could be MCU related. Now, I did see another news story, by the way, I don't have it queued up. and. I can't say that this is definitely going to happen because it's from an unreliable news source, but that the Iron Fist cast is going to be completely recast as we go forward. And one of the reasons why is to make Danny Rand a, a, uh, an Asian actor instead. So they're just, okay. Yeah. I mean, we do have plenty of material to cover. It's not like, you know, we're still going to talk about it. It's great. But now they're going to erase Netflix stuff? No, they want to go forward with Daredevil and uh, Luke Cage and uh, what was the other? Jessica Jones. I, I think they want to actually go forward with those casting, but they want to completely recast the entire sh- series of Iron Fist. So would they basically make it a new Iron Fist? That it, it wouldn't be Danny Rand, it'd be somebody new? I actually don't know. And it, like I said, it's from an unreliable news source, so I don't want to quote it as fact. I don't think I buy that. I, if they were going to say that, yes, the Netflix stuff is part of our universe, we're going to re- reuse those casts, I don't think they would recast Iron Fist. I could see them just not using the character. One, Yeah, one of the main things against it was that they did not choose somebody that was Asian in the role and that they should have. And Kevin Feige might want to correct that. Then they can just do a new Iron Fist and have everybody else because everybody else was great. Once again, unreliable news source. I'm just saying what was out there and speculating and we'll see what happens. But you brought up the fact that this is it. There is nothing else out there. I just want to say that the rumors out, out there are that at least some of the Netflix stuff will carry forward. And I don't know in what form. Will it still be on Disney Plus? Will it go 
enter into the regular MCU? I have no idea. And at this point, they don't have the full rights back because I think I think we covered this before and I think they had to wait two years before they could actually reuse the characters again. So in the grand scheme of things, we're talking about a five-year plan for Marvel. You can still count them in, but you can't actively do anything for two years. Is it two years, though, from when that series ended? So like two years from the end of Daredevil is when they can start using Daredevil? Or and two years from the yeah. end of Jessica Jones is when they can use Jessica Jones? I don't remember the exact determination. I don't think that was actually made public, but everybody was talking about two years. So that's what I'm throwing out there. But yeah, Marvel's uh, Runaways on Hulu season three will be the last thing that was produced on TV and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which I assume it's in the can at this point. They're just waiting to air it next summer. I just know it's not on ABC's mid-season winter, January, February stuff. I think they're going to do what they did last year and make it like the spring yeah, in like in sci-fi's terms, what they would do with shows like this, like with Caprica, they burn the last five episodes in one day. So if ABC wasn't part of Disney, just like Marvel wasn't part of Disney, I could see ABC just wanting to burn all these episodes off like in a day or two. And I'm glad that's not going to be. I think it's going to be a normal airing in next summer, just the way they did it last year as a midsummer thing, because ABC staples of shows it's pretty light. And then you go into the summer and it's really light. Like they have nothing. They're competing with all the streaming services now and everything. I, I think they made the decision to do it in the summer and we're just going to keep on watching it in the summer and next fall. We'll have Disney plus stuff by then. Gosh, I'm old enough to remember how there was nothing in the summer, but reruns. And Maybe a show you didn't watch the previous year. Maybe you got like the reruns and enough of it to follow the show. But now there's the buffet that's <laughs> endless. I'm not complaining, but kind of because there's so much like, stuff. Come on, give us a break. Yeah, just recently we had season two of the Jack Ryan series come out. We had another season of... Uh, uh, ooh. What was that series coming? Well, a bunch of new series too. Like I was talking about Another Life last week, which I'm glad I watched. Yeah, the new season of Sword Art, Art Online, Alization is out. I got to watch, you know, Attack on Attack on Titan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So when we were younger, one of the things that I could count on was on PBS during the summer you would have new episodes of Nova and then you would have new episodes of Doctor Who, which would air coming over from the BBC and then anything else that was airing from the BBC that was brought over for PBS. That was the extent way back then of what was new on TV. And you're absolutely right. It was reruns. And if you didn't catch a show the first time around, it would go in reruns until the new season started. So if you missed an episode of Star Trek. You could catch it in the off season, but that was the only way that you could catch it. You couldn't rent it on VCR. You couldn't uh, stream it anywhere. You would actually have to wait for it to come back on TV. And you would have to choose to grab to something called a TV guide. It was this paper publication that came through the mail and you had to flip through it and you had to circle what you wanted to watch. Or highlight with a ruler. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh huh. I'm trying to remember when TV Guide stopped publication, the paper publication, or is it still paper publication? I think they still make it, but nobody uses it because everybody's got the guide built into their television and you set your DVR, so it doesn't matter when it actually airs. I think it's more of like an entertainment magazine now or something, but. I'm going to call Hallmark out because they drastically changed what their airing of their holiday movies were. Originally, going into November from October, they said they were going to have a new movie out every Thursday and Friday night in the month of November. That has not occurred. And don't think I didn't notice, Hallmark. You're on watch. Yeah. I'm watching you. That's right. <laughs> anyway, that's it for the news this week. If you have. Thoughts about Runaways being the last 
show that was actively being produced, let us know. We will be covering it right after we cover Cloak and Dagger. In the meantime, all three of us are going to go into our kitchen. We're going to throw our refrigerators down the stairwell and we're going to get on out of here. Uh, guys, my refrigerator didn't fit in the doorway to go to the basement, so it's still in the first floor. I don't have a stairwell, so... Hmm. I do, but it's heavy, so I didn't bother. Okay. Anyway, I just want to thank our listeners very much for sticking with us. We really appreciate that. Hope you're enjoying the coverage of Cloak and Digger. I know several of you have contacted us about it, so I hope you're enjoying it. And if you have something to say about Cloak and Digger, let us know. Yes, thank you to everyone that's listening, and we look forward to the next thing that we get to discuss with you. Yes, thank you for watching, interacting with us, uh, especially like on the Discord. And we're not going anywhere. You know, we still have a bunch of stuff to talk about. We're here. So, yeah, you don't need to worry about that. We're still here. I'm excited about the next couple of phases in MCU movies. I got a lot of cool stuff coming up. So yeah, we're not going anywhere with Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. anytime soon. Until next time, I'm Director SP. I'm Agent Haley. And I'm Agent Michelle. See you guys next time. Bye. 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 Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of Shield, or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2019.